saw a documentary on Luno and what Herbie Hancock said in a way pertains to us. Uh, and he said, personal expression, non-judgmental, collaboration and freedom. So we all have that right now. We may be isolated, but we have the ability to use our mind and our imagination. So this is a good place to keep being creative and keep using your mind. And now today, first I wanna say, hi Jennifer and the Channel 22 staff, thank you. Hi Corinne, Phoebe, Jim. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Today we are reading from Ann Stanford's In the Garden, published by Coanga Press. I will introduce the readers now and I will not introduce them between the last reader and them. The distinguished readers are, in order of appearance, James Cushing, who will introduce Anne Stanford and her book, then Phoebe McAdams, Corinne Conley, James Cushing, Harry Northup, me, will read. Here's James Cushing. Harry's asked me to begin uh, this afternoon's um, uh, the, the performance by reading aloud the uh, the blurb that I wrote on the back of uh, of the book that we're treating ourselves to today, Cream of the Garden. Anne Stanford, 1916 to 1987, as original and important a poetic voice as Robinson Jeffers or Gary Snyder, built her severely beautiful poems out of the very earth and air of the California landscape bring careful eye and elegant fiction to her lifelong encounter with the distances and intimacies of her birthplace. Anne Stanford's poems appeared in prestigious magazines, including Poetry, The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, and she saw eight collections of them acclaimed in her lifetime in Narrow Bound, The White Bird, Magellan, The Weathercock, The Descent, Climbing up to light in Mediterranean air and the Countess of Four Leaves. Now, in an edition fully approved by the poet's daughter, Rosanna Norton, going to press presents Dreaming of the Garden, Mr. Anne Stanford's last manuscript. Dreaming of the Garden completes an impressive body of work that earned its author a Shelley Memorial Award, a National Institute of Arts and Letters Award, two MEA grants and the admiration of fellow masters such as Lee Swenson, James Dickey, and Kenneth Rexrock, whose 1966 description is still accurate. Quote, crystalline would be the word for the illuminating clarity of Anne Stanford's poetry, except that hers is not an inorganic but a living crystal. Few poets today better exemplify the criteria of wholeness, harmony, and radiance that the great philosopher said all arts should possess. Hers is an intimate but luminous vitality. The poetry of Anne Stanford. <clears throat> Two. It is comfortable. It is so comfortable there in the gar garden. You can wear an old toga. Pliny the Younger. And this is an introduction to this section. The aesthetics of an age appear in all the arts, and one can find striking parallels among them. See how the square straight beds of the Renaissance garden, resembling in form the square poetic stanzas of the period, gave way to the curved borders and wandering edges of artificial lakes in the Romantic period at the same time that Wordsworth, Wordsworth rode in the long overlapping lines of mists and ruins and vine-covered cottages. And the poems of the 18th century are filled with nymphs and gods <clears throat> while their temples were built in the gardens. And in the garden, which is a living thing, one can find parallels to the life of the artist the theory under which the poet works, the joys and hopes at the beginning, the setbacks and struggles, just as the garden shifts through neglect, heat and cold, torrents of rain, vandals, all change the life of the garden, just as they do that of the artist. M.C. Rockstone, The Garden and Other Arts, 1869. 
Dreaming the Garden, one. It must first of all be fun. There must be an air of insouciance, of je ne sais quoi about it. Someone else has already moved the stones, lined the soil. You have only to turn the shovel lightly. The ruins have left moisture, but not too much. You plan the lawn sloping to the terrace, the marble balustrades, cracks hidden under the wash of plumbago. You are half down the slope. Beyond are oaks and beech trees surrounding the view of the lake. Beyond it, the lake, are mountains, green overlaying the hidden villas. A single boat, boat loiters among lily pads. But there is work to do. You put the shovel deep and turn up humus, earthworms, a bulb or two, beginning to send a green shaft skyward. By the lake, back from the point where the trees obscure the boat now, a cluster of statues watches the view. From atop the columned wall, above the anchorage, the boat will be heading this way. To your left, past the maze, maze, the lawn edged by nymphs, hip deep in azaleas, moves toward the folly. Beside the stairs to the terrace, geraniums flow out of their vases, pink and lavender. Off toward the south, aisles of lantana and cannas, the air harsh where the sun <clears throat> drags the wrong scent from the strident blooms. But on the right, the cascade plunges through pools, descends in shallow falls, noisy as a brook. Grottos and archways span and interrupt. Dolphins rise from the pool, and a great shell collects the last overflow from which it vanishes. You have done so much this morning. Two shovelfuls of earth. A third leads to the clipped ilex on the terrace. Diamonds, circles of low hedge, hold bouquets. The square pool marks the heart. Beyond, water and light make the statues move. The sky, a lake of clouds under the arches by the shell. You walk under the falling tide with the nymphs who hold spirals of shells wreathed in ivy. You go up this water stairs. Cascades rush by on either hand. Shade dapples the path. You reach the main pool. Against the hillside, a grove. In the grove, the goddess. White, serious, stone. Follows the deer at the edge of the glade. You have come just in time. Two. Start with the bounds. What's to go out or stay? The view you'll keep, the lake, the fading ranges. Columns of cypress shield the western slope. As for the south, arrange a grove of olives. On the north, white oleander can form a wall beside the avenue. Over the walk, you put an arch of vines. You must be firm with space. Even the sky becomes your own. Divide the sky. Let it be lanes or views, parterres or rounds of blue above the pool. Cut it with branches, winter white, in shapes of leaded glass. Break it with scattered leaves into shimmering drops or panes between the arches of the hedge or dark with lines or circles from your vista under the trees. You've set the bounds, laid out earth and sky. Whatever you do, things will not stray this way. Three, it helps if you have something old to set among the hedges. Say a column topped by a statue of Ceres, behind her a rondure of privet, or a sundial on a post of white marble in the circle of lawn. Where the pile of native stone backs the fountain, a group of nymphs sporting jets of spray from the cascade hidden behind the potting shed. Some urns of terracotta can hold Sylvia, the yellow anthers bright in the sun. 
Not too much color, though. Let the subtle glow of marble hold your attention. If you are fortunate, you will find fragments, a broken head of an emperor, the pediment of an altar, or, truly blessed, a fawn tangled in grape leaves. Set him among the boxes of orange against the ilex hedge, the gravel path widening before him. Even a few broken shards will enhance the wall behind the fountain. The past must be used. The sarcophagi flaunting geraniums, and where the wood overtakes you, a path through the overgrown laurel, the tangle of oak and acacia, always at war with one another. Four, it rains. The lake drowns in haze. The grove beside it is a distant country. Fog moves in billows like nymphs escaped from the fountains, their white drapes drawn about them. Rain shoots from the downspouts, jets from the mouths of gargoyles, or rolls off the roof, splashing and rebounding. The terrace is a pool catching the gush of waters from the mouths of eagles, the vases of naiads, and horse-maned dolphins of the sea god. The villa is a fountain where you swim like a minnow in the green light of leaves dripping their cascades. The sky darkens. It is a grotto filled with swaying moss. The dark niches holding satyrs grinning as they wave obscene fingers or sneer at you from the green solace of vines. The terrace where you dug is mud. It melts, sliding down the water stairs between the troughs where freshets leap from banks of honeysuckle. Water runs between the balustrades in waterfalls that merge like the outflow of a thousand breasts into the great pool on the lower terrace, where the hedge floats like a carved isthmus among islands of clipped lavender. Water flows from the boughs of the pine trees, pours from the laurels, circles the oranges, dangles in narrow streams from the walnuts. The lake must be rising among the oak trees, making a water temple of the columns by the landing. The statues gaze at their reflections, pocked by descending drops. You hear the counterpoint of the shattering cascade off the edge of the roof, the tattoos of rain, a slow drip, drop, somewhere it shouldn't be. The birds have taken to cover. You hear no sound but the steady water music of the garden. But it must make sense. The mad cascade the storm dropped yesterday has destroyed the parterres. They are sunk in mud. The stairways slipping with dirt and leaves. Everything drips. The eaves, the edges of trees, the hedges. It was more than a water garden, a meeting of too many streams. After a day of sun, you can clean out the path, wash off the terraces, put drains where streams carried away the soil. But today, while the clouds decide whether to go or stay, get the details. What is the garden made of? Plains, levels, paving paths, trees and hedges, low plantings and high, sun and shade, color and light. Down by the lake, already there are beaches and oaks, a drift of wild cyclamen. Farther up for sun, plant a spread of lantana, a border of lilies. On the terrace end, magnolias. Around the reflecting pool, urns of geraniums, plumbago, purple bougainvillea, vases of lemon set on balustrades, and hedges of laurel, cypress, holly. For the old walls, jasmine, Clematis, honeysuckle, roses beside iris and loquat, 
oleanders, mandarins. For autumn color, liquid dambars. Persimmons against the pine trees. Pomegranate and flowering thyme. Lavender, shrub roses, fuchsias, and wisteria on the steeper banks. You will want mimosa and orange trees, the acrid scent of alders by the stream. But your list is already too long, and you've left no room for the kitchen garden. You have forgotten the plan, the cool laying out of the ground. You have overwhelmed the garden, unthinking as any god. Dreaming the Winter Garden, one. Early snow, unexpected, falls on the terraces. The flakes are large and soft. They scatter on the path like cherry blooms by the kitchen garden. You go through the gate to the canal. There, puzzled swans break a skim of ice as they glide to shore. From the bare limbs of the river birch, Snow drops in gouts on your shoulders. The sky lightens as you cross the bridge. Will you try the maze? But the sky lowers again. You might be lost there, and the great clots of snow falling faster. You walk through the orchard with its expected peach, pear, apple, plum, the figs espaliered on the wall. Next, the topiary garden, now melting stone where the careful diamonds hide their secrets. It is getting colder, and the wind penetrates the hedges, but you have still the ballroom lying in two long fields, empty with a desolate sound. It is too vast. You must get to shelter. You hurry past pillars of snow, their circles etched in ice. You wander from the path, tripping on borders. The snow falls faster. You wander among boxwood. Are you back in the maze? You cross under an arch, stumble among stones. You crawl under the aerial hedge, blunder downstairs toward the water, it has vanished. It has vanished along with the swans, with the redbud, river oak, magnolias, the kitchen garden, the ice house, and the mount and the meadow beyond the fences. The house is gone and the stable, and there is nothing but a white wall moving around you, nothing but snow and silence. Six. You must get back to the plan. The central theme, the axis of the garden, the great effect each part must be subject to. You can pull it together by a great stairway, perhaps, breaking across the terraces, holding them like a knot around a bundle or a major prospect. You must frame the view between windows of laurel or a balustrade at the edge of the terrace. Don't let it simply slide away. If the terrain allows, you may put a central walk down to the lake. The slope will give you streams from the upper cascade, a suite of stairs and lawns and pools pools that rise in fountains, a dolphin or seashore, a goddess surrounded by naiads, or an arched tower from which the flow thunders into whirlpools. At angles to the axis will be corridors between gardens of cypress, holm oak, chestnut, or cedar. These passages lead into gardens, each with its focus, statue, flower bed, sundial. Or let the main path be a corridor between privet, 
The clipped alleyways lead to quiet openings beside lily ponds, or a central fountain, or a stair uphill to a portico over the blue paving of the lake with its grand vista fronting the water. The terrace leading to the Belvedere, formal and open, inviting by its long straight paths, the gaiety of sunlight, the mock of shadow, the white admonition of the statues. Seven. Things can get so easily out of hand. Whatever you do, you must keep order. Here where the horses broke through things have gone to ruin. Refugees camped here. The statues are lost or broken. The lilies drag from the pond where they washed their rags and their children. They burn the hedges for firewood, cooking thin gruel, warming their hands, blackening the wall behind the fires. It was frosty those nights. The temple of Demeter hung with bedclothes to keep out the wind. Her columns slant with ropes. The goddess fallen, boots chipped her fingers, her torch carried away, her basket broken. Up by the terrace wall, some spread their tents with poles of cut cypress. They thatched them with branches. Boys pushed the urns from the terrace, carved their names on the wall. Sheep and goats nibbled the thyme of the parterre, ate the leaves of hydrangeas, and cows tethered to the columns of the balustrades pulled them out like ragged teeth. The garden disappeared in mud and slime and the trample of feet. But the old ilexes remain. Their twisted roots hold the rifts of a wall built by the emperor. This was ruin before. Now you begin. Eight. Yes, it is getting harder. The easy part was beginning, dreaming the garden. But it is midday and there's much to do, more perhaps than you are able. The ground where you dig has become harder. The tangle of laurel beyond keeps out sunlight. You stand on the long terrace where the ground was trampled under so many feet. When you began, it did not seem this way. The shovel went into the loam into the soft leavings of leaves. The lake is farther away and the boat has disappeared. The cloud coming up from the west throws a shadow on the lake. It goes dull like a piece of chiseled slate. Rain will bring mud. You'd better dig while there is time. You look at the stains where fire burned the wall, the graffiti, and the torn balustrades, your arms ache. You must bring leaves and manure, gravel for paths. You started so bravely. All you did was dream. You dreamed the garden. Start now. There is time. Tomorrow, you can put up the statues, mend the broken urns, take another look at the long vista you first thought of. Nine, deserted garden. This garden needs you. Between its walls, a central path, iris and asters, pear trees and rose, and the blue of wisteria over the gateway. But beyond the gate, Matted grass and weeds overrun the paths, splash against walls, and ivy thickens over the fallen columns. 
Once there were laurels here, now only traces of ruined walkways. The deserted terrace overlooks the sea gate and the broken hedges where the white, deep-rooted morning glory sprawls over broken rubble. You long to pull up weeds, clear out the paths, cut the thicket of myrtle, set up the columns, plant foxgloves and asters, rosemary, marigolds, put lemon against the walls, trim the broken hedges, and sit at evening, looking over the garden and the wall, where the warm blooms mingle with the wind from the sea but it doesn't belong to you. Not for you to untangle the smother of green. You, with your hillside waiting, deserted, unfinished, as you mourn for this lost garden. Dreaming the winter garden, too. It is mid-morning. You are resting on the terrace, the broad walk paved in sun, yet chill. It is January, and the wind blows down from the mountains beyond the garden. On their peaks, snow. But here, the earth begins to put on color. You sip the coffee so kindly sent from the house behind you. Set your cup on the wrought iron table. The hostess has thought of that. You have never seen her. And over the, and look over the lawn toward the statue, Louis the Fifteenth listening to Cupid. The king stands or sits, from here you can't be sure, under a pediment, a simple triangle held up by columns. Is there a roof as well? One day you must stroll across that mile of lawn, but now the sun has disappeared and the terrace feels the bite of wind. You walk a few paces to the balustrade, set with the usual urns, these without flowers, closed at the top of a tender stone that weathers. Some of the garlands are broken, grand nevertheless. At the end of the paving, three dogs attack a boar. One clings to the underbelly, the others climb on his back or snap at his jowls. It is a draw at the moment, as, and as yet no blood, only the green velvet of verdigris, like a net over the scene, as though it is happening in a dream. You look away, but in the same green and opposite, the dogs have cornered a deer and seem to be winning. Noble stag, you cry, but what can you tell it, mired in green as it is? forever in combat. You move toward the rose garden. A hedge shields you from the north, but wind rattles through the bare branches at the top of the arbor. You take shelter under the giant oaks among the camellias, deep pink and light, the yellow stamens like eyes watching where you go, past the dolphin fountain where the wind blows spray across the path to the safe shelter of the trees again. And back over the open lawn to the terrace, broad, swept clean, empty, the table gone, the urns flaking, the beasts still tearing one another. 10. It is too cold to work. No one cares anyway, you tell yourself. It's, it's your garden. If it lies forever undone, that's your business. It's only for joy. You are tired of the stubborn limbs all greedy for light, nodding themselves, choking one another. The ground, baked hard, cracking in the sun, and the creatures around and underground waiting for something to grow. Birds mock you from the trees, daring you to light like the others. The lake has gone down to a stinking pool edged with mud. The boat rots on the shore. The seams break open in air. Weeds hold the anchor chain. 
and the sky is neither sun nor cloud, but brown at the edges, pale at the center, and a thick haze fills the gaps between the mountains. If anyone cared, you repeat, you might untangle the wood, close up the passageways to the underground, rip out the vines that strangle the trees, the thorny weeds. If anyone, you say again, if anyone, 11, The garden is only for you. It is a shell in which you live. It is a wall to keep you from the world. You are the center, not the pool where dryads pour water forever in meaningless gestures, not the stairs with stone balustrades where eagles spread their useless wings of stone, nor the clipped alley between cypress hedges. You are the garden. Let it circle around you. You are the heart of the maze. Where the laurel draws its own pyramid, shakes out its limbs, overhangs the path and takes the form of trees. Leave Daphne there, her freed limbs shaking in the autumn wind. See the colors of autumn chrysanthemums, asters, the lawn covered with leaves where yellow and red rain from the trees. And for your pleasure, the black crested quail wander over the lawn. The boat drifts further away. It is leaving and flocks of traveling common birds feast on the red berries. The orange trees set here and there, forget the terraces, and the path curves away among the pine trees. You are inside the garden and it takes your form. It is real now, not a plan, not even a vista, but a warm wall in winter, an old coat thrown around you. Makers, the sword, I made the sword. Here in the fire, I plunged the steel, white hot bearing the beat of the apprentice's hammers. One, two, three, over and over on the steel bar, over and over the firing, the beating of hammers till the bar is dense with the struggle. And I bend it again and again, over and over the pounding, the cutting, the bending. Layer on layer, the crude bar resists me. I have given it courage. It has held day and night against heat, against pounding. At last I have shaped it, hardened its edges. It becomes a mirror of my hand, hardened in fire, with the metal that resists and is beaten, folded and beaten to the luster of the still pond that is windless, that carries one gold curving branch in its center, spread with the gold leaves of springtime and waiting to bring you this mirror, this hardness, this ardor of hammering home. Makers, the weaver, I am the weaver. Before the last frosts, I planted the seeds covered with straw from the reeds by the river, green rising under the moon in springtime, the jagged long leaves lifting a tide around me. In summer, the blue seeds appeared, grew into harvest, and the blue of indigo rose in the water when the cloth I had woven took the color of sky, took the azure of evening, took the darkness of blue night without stars, shining the cloth that I carried down to the river stones, carefully washing the dross from the workroom, leaving blue caught as the clear afternoon looking down on the river. The sedges dripped toward the water, dipped in blue, dropped from the sky, and a broad channel ran from the cloth over the blue rocks, under the sky that would darken into still ponds where the frogs turned to blue statues 
in cold streams of midnight. I have woven through springtime at dawn at my shuttle. Now the blue sky dries in my yard. This blue will not fade. It will darken to midnight. It will tell of the river. It will speak of the weaver. It will last you a hundred years out of myself, out of the sky and river woven. Makers, the bell. I am the bell. I am from earth and fire. Now the bronze gleams round my shoulder. I hold your prayers, burned to ash, and sent to the skies with my echoing. I echo your names and the names of God. Further and further the ring widens, grows fainter, never dies away, but quivers alone at the edge of the hills, caught like night's fog below the mountains. Long and deep the hollow within me, where the sound comes to birth, where the shudder first catches the bronze at my side, vibrates and travels round and round my surface like the thongs of a sling whirled in air till it borrows flight from its circling and the sound flies out while the trees flutter with birds flung like notes to the wind and the river catches my singing sound and the wind carries my notes like names of the gods over and over. And this is the last poem of the book and the last poem of the reading. 365 poems. They will be floating from my mouth like doves, the bright scars from the sleeves of the magician. Look, I am spinning five of them over my head. It has been a bad dream when I forgot to twirl one like a flag every day to walk into town like a parade with flutes and drums with timbrels. They will be chariots drawn by lions. They will be gazelles and leopards. They will fly around me like a flock of birds. They will be my traveling companions. They will gnaw at me day and night like minnows or devour me whole like the whale. I will stand among them as among trees of the forest calling these are all mine. They will tell me secrets. Wherever I go, like the roll of drums, salvos of guns, rockets kindling the air, they will arrive day and night. I will beg them to go away. Yeah. They will torment me like nets, swoop by like hawks at noon, bewilder my dreams at evening. They will say, welcome home. Thank you all. You all did a marvelous reading. And uh, I know that this poetry is from the generation from before us. And the thing I like about Anne Stanford is that she was a poet who went down to her study and wrote every morning. And she was also a scholar. And, uh, you know, she had a certain sense of decorum. It's different the way we write today. You would never see a swear word in her poetry. Uh, it's not as explosive, but I enjoy uh, and love her poetry. And this was also, as Jim mentioned, her last manuscript. So just for Coanga Press, whose three members are here today, Phoebe McAdams, James Cushion, and I, it was an honor for Joanne Lom Labombard to give me the rent manuscript. And then we got permission, as Jim said, from Rosanna Norton uh, to publish this book. So that was a thrill in itself. And that's what uh, press is about, you know, publishing good poetry and having uh, cooperative support. And uh, what I would like to do, we still have 18 minutes left. So why don't we each take about, uh, you know, about three or four minutes and just talk either about this book uh, or about some poetry that you've been reading these days and we can just do that. So let's start uh, with the first reader. Uh, we'll go with Phoebe. And then, did you want to say something, Jennifer? I do. I do. Can you hear me? Yes. 
I would like to take or have you guys take a couple of minutes to talk about um, Harry's most recent book, because sharing about Harry's writing, especially now as people are starting to look for gifts for the holidays, um, your book specifically coming from people who live here as gifts to their family, I think would be incredible to give them insight into what the experience is. Um, and maybe it's, you say it in ways that other people can't find, um, ways to articulate. And certainly there are so many pieces in your book that relate specifically to you and to Holly, but there are, I think, glimpses of, of what it is to feel like you found, um, you found a new home and been embraced by a community of people. You know, my internet was breaking up, but I think what you said was for me, you know, that's the only part I heard at the very end to say something about my, uh, creativity in terms of writing the book and living here in, in PTF. Is that what you wanted me to say, Jennifer? Well, um, is the internet better now? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. What I was saying was, I think having people here on campus understand more about ways that they can get your book. And, um, I think you articulate living in a communal experience specific to MPTF in such a beautiful way that it would be a lovely gift for people on campus to give to their family members because you may be able to articulate it in ways that they cannot. And there are certainly many passages in your book that are very personal and are unique to you and to Holly. But I think that there are... Um, there are, are moments that you can hook into that feeling of being welcome and um, connected. Okay. Well, uh, I will try to do my best. It, you can get the book by typing, by Googling uh, Harry E. Northup, SPD, Love Poem to MPTF. It will also be advertised uh, and you can buy it on Amazon. Or the simplest way, if you wanted to, was to just contact me, Harry North of Villa 119, and I will get a copy from our press uh, to send to you, and you'll uh, save shipping costs. So that's the way. You can also type in coangapress.com and order it uh, via that website. And for me, I would just like to say, uh, for me, poetry is personal. I mentioned earlier uh, what Herbie Hancock said, personal experience, but you also have to learn the tradition as we all know. And living here, we have the ability to be free. We're taken care of. So we have the ability, it's like having a patron. The classical poets had patrons and then things were taken care of. You know, the, the medical for us, the dental, food, transportation. And so you have the time to imagine things and you also have the time to write if you're so inclined. But I would just say, uh, for me, it's just looking, starting with the visual. You know, we walk around the campus. I know Corinne walks around a lot. You walk around the campus, and what do you see? And then, okay, we have a mask on, so we may not be able to have the sense of smell so much, but we do smell the fragrances. So through our senses, you know, the sight and, and the eyes, the sight, the eyes, the hearing, the taste, et cetera, we're able to gather information through our senses. So I would say just get a, uh, I know you didn't ask me how to write, but I will tell you what I do. I just sit in, in my villa and I write down my experiences of the day. And then sometimes if, I, you know, I write every day. And so I, what I write about is what I see here. So what I do is I write down, you know, being a method actor, I learned to use myself. And there are a lot of actors here. And we learn to write from ourselves. That's a starting point. And then obviously we're influenced by the literature we've read. And so if you read poetry a lot, you'll see what has been done in the past. It's like music. You know, Wynton Marcellus says, if you only know your own generation's music and you don't know what came before you, you will not know your your music will not survive. So I, I write down what I see here. And I'm also 
grateful, I think that's important too. So emotion and gratitude. I mean, I'm, my wife and I, when we came here, MPTF was like Shangri-La to my wife. And she was taken so good care of. She didn't have to cook. She didn't have to go get groceries. She didn't have to take the house. All she had to do, if she wanted to, she didn't have to, was concentrate on her creativity. And Jennifer Clymer and Bob Beecher both have a loving support of the creative. So we're supported by our community here. And so I use the word non-judgmental. Uh, the, the things I've done with Channel 22 and Jennifer, never once did they tell me what to do. They are there to help us. And so my poetry comes out of personal experience. And it, it, I realized as an early actor that your life is valuable. You don't have to be an intellectual or an academician to write poetry in no big words. You can write the way your mind speaks. So I write down things like that. And, uh, you know, that's pretty simple for me right there. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what else to say. I don't have my book in front of me, but it's to me, it's based on emotion. You know, we, we're alone here and, and we're isolated and so we miss people, obviously, but we have all those memories within us. So you you sit down and you write about your grief and then you just write it down. And sometimes I would break up. I would be crying. I would be writing. But I was not judgmental. And I would just allow the emotional arc of the poem to rise and fall. And it's about that simple. And then you write and write and write. And then out of uh, notebooks of poetry, every once in a while, there's a good, strong poem. Uh, could you just tell me if I'm what else I might focus on, Jennifer? I mean, I get caught up in my own. Corinne? I'll say something about Harry's book. Uh, because I moved in here last uh, uh, January, and um, I, I, walking around, which I do, I walk all the time. One of the uh, uh, things that I looked at all these wonderful trees and shrubs, it's just a, a, a beautiful campus. But I didn't know the names of any, and they all seemed strange. I, for the last 20 years, I've been living in Canada. So, the, you know, it was kind of, I did. I, you know, I did live in the Palisades, so I, I do know something about California gardens. But I got all sorts of books, uh, ca California shrubs and trees and uh, botany books and uh, plants in the desert to, right. to help myself. But, uh, but I, I, you know, I... The, once I got Harry's book and Holly's book, both of them, which describe the campus, describe the tea, the trees and the shrubs is a much better, much nicer way to approach the garden and the trees and the shrubs uh, through poetry uh, rather than the botany books, which were only <laughs> confusing me. So really they are a delight and they're just wonderful if you live here to get some of this poetry in your head as you're walking around because they describe things that you actually see. It makes it so much, so much more beautiful. Well, and also, you know, I, I don't know if I'm interrupting you because I, I see you're frozen on my screen, Corinne. So if I am, forgive me. And That's I all right. No, carry on. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me, but also what I, what I do is I walk around and, you know, Gertrude Stein says it's important to name things. So, you know, the gardeners have, I've learned the names of trees from gardeners. One time I was over by the cottages and I asked one of them, what's the name of that tree? And he said, carrotwood tree. And I didn't understand him. I said, what? And he said, you know, like Bugs Bunny, you know, and he kind of made it like an eating. And I said, carrots? He said, yeah, carrot tree. So, you know, I learned, I learned over 30 names of trees. So then, you know, it's when you name something, too. It's like naming Phoebe, naming Jennifer, naming Corinne. You know, you start looking and, you know, you give in to the and all of those trees are there. And so there's a personal connection with uh, I don't know if you would call it the the, the greater, you know, the, the grounds that we live on. But it's such a beautiful campus and uh, we're really fortunate. So uh, I'm not sure. You know, if I'm the right person to even be talking about 
Uh, what do you think, Phoebe, about what uh, Jennifer asked? You're very articulate. You were a school teacher. <laughs> well, don't forget that I, Holly and Harry were living here at my house after the fire. And I had an extra place for, for them, a kind of nice, a nice room with a sliding door that goes outside. And so they were here, and I and I was with them as they tried to navigate this catastrophe in their lives, and how um, the the people who were the were running the apartment where they lived were very unsympathetic and not at all helpful. And then Harry, I remember, you know, Harry thought, well, you know, I'm going to go up and talk to the people at MPT and at, at NPTF and see what they say about this. And then he came back and said, because this was an emergency, we were able to get to the front of the waiting list and they happened to have a room available. So then there was a whole slew of organizing and getting rid of a lot of stuff and getting the paperwork done for when they moved in. And I was amazed when I went up to MPTF because uh, I have been to other, um, other assisted living facilities and it, it was so beautiful. And I also felt Holly was, had a hard time getting around. I mean, she was on a walker and could not walk well. And so their life, you know, their life was difficult. And when they got to MPTF, um, it was as if this great burden came off them. And Harry, after a while at MPTF, I said to, I said to friends, you know, I've never seen Harry so happy. I mean, I think the burden of wondering what's going to ha happen in the future, what's going to happen to us, how are we going to organize it? What about Holly? To have that all lifted and then to have this wonderful care that's that's given at the facility, I think that opened up, um, op it kind of opened up a room where there had been worry and there had been concern and there had been all these things that you needed to do. And suddenly there was this space for Holly to write her wonderful book, Weather, which really, you know, she said, I'm, I sit here and the main thing that I look at is the weather. And that title came out of that. And then to have this book, I mean, I see these in a way as kind of companion books of sort of the two books that Holly and Harry wrote while they were together at MPTF. So, I mean, I think the two of them, when they go wonderful Christmas present, if you're looking for Christmas presents, Holly and Harry's books would be wonderful. And as he said, you can order them in all kinds of places through Harry or on coingapress.com. But this is just, this is such a, beautiful um, tribute to this space that he is in and um, and the incredible uh, precision with which he tracks his experiences and his inner life and and melds those together in this book I mean these are simple poems they're not they're not complicated odes and and they're these just these beautiful moments of life, one after another. Um, I, it's an, I think it's an extraordinary book. It's a wonderful book and it chronicles their life together and it chronicles a little bit about Holly's death, but it's not a, it's not a maudlin book. It's not a sad book. It's a beautifully precise book. And every time I open it up, I will find you behind a tree. I will find you in a bouquet of flowers. I will find you in a cup of coffee, in a book of pastoral poetry, in an absent love, in a sorrowful friend, in a narcissistic friend. This book finds us. It's wonderful. It finds us. <laughs> Thank you, Phoebe. That was very well put. And the other thing which, you know, I, I, I would find myself too writing, and it's like a prayer. You know, it's like, you know, uh, looking for an answer and finding the answer within me, and also gratif gratitude, giving thanks. You know, every night I give thanks. And while I'm writing, I give thanks. A lot of these poems, I would literally bend over and I'd just break down and I'd keep writing. And so just the gratitude of being here 
And the interesting thing happened to me here too was I before I came here, I would have real highs and real lows. Ever since I came here, it was just like right, very center. And I think it came from uh, Phoebe touched on this was a feeling of being taken care of. You know, it's like being taken care of, and it's really um, a really a, a once in a lifetime thing. And uh, we're, we're real fortunate, all of us, to be living here. And I'm fortunate to have poetry. Because the thing about poetry, too, which I keep trying to do is to discover, you know, the word troubadour comes from the word trobar. It means to discover. In other words, uh, next week I'm doing one with Bob Beecher about the French poets. Real quickly, I know it's almost time, but Mallarmé was a teacher. He didn't write a lot. He didn't publish a lot. But he just wanted to keep finding a new way of literature, a new way of writing. So that's part of it, too, even though we're older to keep finding ways, new ways, the way we put words together and let them generate new meaning. And it's uh, 159. So, uh, you know, thank you, Jennifer, for asking that question. And thank you, Phoebe and Corinne and uh, Jim Cushing for that great uh, reading, all of you. Mm-hmm.